is taught. Hello everybody and welcome back to TipTat and welcome to a new series, Intro to Photoshop. In this series, we're going to be going over the complete basics in Photoshop, uh, getting you in touch and started with all the different little tools and things like that. And then if you like this sort of thing, we're going to delve a little bit deeper and do an intermediate series as well. So make sure you let me know if you like this by all the usual channels, commenting, liking, subscribing, uh, ringing the bell, etc. We're going to take a look at creating some of these abstract geometric things that I've been doing. I've been doing a design a day challenge and these ones um, b uh, demonstrate the basic tools of Photoshop quite well. We're going to look at recreating this guy here. It's going to help us learn how to deal with images inside of Photoshop, how to deal with shapes, how to deal with the marquee tool, how to deal with uh, different layer effects, different um, blending modes, things like that. And we're going to do a little bit of text as well, just to get you guys to grips with the absolute basics of the tools inside of Photoshop. So if that's for you, stick around. Now, first thing to say is my interface might look a little bit different to yours because I've got a custom setup for doing things. Um, however, if at any point I mention a window which you do not see, it will be under the window sub menu here somewhere. OK, so if I say I'll pick your color palette and you don't have color open or you don't have your swatches window open, you can open that from here. So before you start saying, oh, I don't know that where that is, I don't have that option. If you've got Adobe Photoshop CC, you do have that option. It'll be in there underneath the window sub menu. OK, let's get started then. The first thing you're going to need to do is open up your project. Now, I'm going to close off all these because yours is probably going to look something like this when you first open it up. OK, now all you need to do is hit the create new option and that brings up a module window here which gives you all the different options of creating a canvas for you to get started working on. Now, you can see all your recent items, or you might have some examples here if this is the first time opening Photoshop. You've got your properties down the right-hand side, and you've got some nice presets so you can get started quickly. For example, if you're working primarily with photos, it would give you some standard photo-sized artboards. If you're working with print, it would do the same with standard paper and the same for art, illustration, web, mobile, film, etc. The main difference between these will be the um, color mode that you're working in and the uh, pixels per inch or DPI of the image. For example, if I choose a print preset here and choose A4, um, it's going to be in millimeters rather than pixels. It's going to be at 300 pixels an inch, and it'll either be RGB or CMYK color, depending on um, what your end product is going to be. Usually print is CMYK, but I'm going to leave it on RGB for now because we're not actually going to be printing this. OK, um, the reason I'm going to choose A4, though, is because I want those particular dimensions for this particular project. And I want the high pixels per inch because I've got some really high resolution images. So for this time, we're going to choose print and we're going to hit create. What that does is it creates a uh, document for you, a canvas at that size, OK, which is perfect for our needs. Now, the first thing you need to worry about is what the hell is going on in this interface. And even though it might be slightly different, Yours is probably going to have a similar setup in that you're going to have your toolbar down the side. And this is all your creation, editing, manipulation tools, all the things you need to edit stuff that is on your canvas. And down the right hand side, you're probably going to see something called layers. And this is where you organize and distribute all of the artwork that you put onto the canvas. So creation, modification over on the left, addition and removals over on the right. OK, don't worry too much about the rest of these windows. You'll be able to bring them up if they're important but most of the time they're not going to be. The first thing we're going to do then is start working on how to manipulate images within, within Photoshop. And then we're going to take a look at um, starting creating some shapes and working with some text and editing blend modes and things like that. OK, so the first thing you need to do is open up your um, assets. Now, I downloaded these from pexels.com. This isn't a paid video. I just think they're great. P-E-X-E-L-S. That's uh, Papa Echo X-Ray Echo Lima Sierra dot uh, com. I had to think there how to spell pexels. Um, they've got loads of stock images. They're really cool, including this one, which I'm going to drag and drop onto my canvas. Once you release you're going to get a image of your an image of your image <laughs> on your canvas with this sort of big x going through it and little control corners on each of your edges and the middle of each of your sides if you're any way familiar with any other adobe suite this should look pretty familiar if you click and drag on any of those squares you can manipulate the size and shape of your image okay if you um, click and drag on any of those while holding alt 
then it's going to start controlling it from the center. And if you click and drag on any of those while holding shift, it's going to constrain the proportions so that you don't squash or stretch your image. OK, now if you hit enter, that places it into your scene and physically puts it there. If you would hit an escape from that um, option, it wouldn't actually place it onto your, your scene. OK, so drag and drop. Now, what I'm going to do is hold alt whilst I scale this image and hold shift. And what that does is it scales from the center, but constrains its proportions, meaning I can scale up until this image fills our canvas. Then I'm just going to drag him down a little bit until the top of that image snaps to the edge of the board like so to give him a bit of headroom. If your image doesn't snap, or you're not getting these little pink lines, which are known as smart guides, which help you align things to center and things like that a bit easier, then all you need to do is go up to view and make sure that snap is on and also go to show and then smart guides and make sure that's on as well. So with your image in place, just hit enter. Now, that's the same whether you're placing uh, an image, a video, a PDF, any kind of media, you can drag and drop and do that sort of thing, okay? Um, if you're working with uh, vector shapes and stuff like that, then it might give you an option of how to import that, whether it's a smart object or pixels, but we might get into that in a later episode. Um, for now, suffice to say that this image is on the stage. And if you look over here in your layers panel, you'll notice that it's here above the background layer as well. You'll also notice if you've got an eagle eye that over the thumbnail, there's this little picture that looks like an image with a box on it. What that means is it's a smart object. OK, now to understand what a smart object is, you need to understand about rasterization inside of Photoshop and the difference between raster and vector. Now, essentially, a rasterized image or a raster based piece of artwork is um, values assigned to pixels, which means that if you have a 1000 by 1000 pixel image, and you squash and stretch it and apply those changes and then blow it up to 10 times its size and shrink it down and increase it again and do all this. Each one of those changes you make is going to decrease the quality because it's destructive because that information, the colors in the pixels and things like that, is all hardwired into those pixels. However, a vector based piece of artwork is based on mathematical equations that depict what that image is. OK, so a red circle, for example, would have a radius, a circumference, a um, color attributed to it. And when you change that, you're just changing the equation that forms that circle. When you drop an image into Photoshop, which is primarily a raster based piece of software, it treats it as a smart object. And what that means is you can squash and stretch this as much as you like, even though it is a raster based image and it won't decrease in quality. And the reason for that is it's not actually rasterizing this image. It's not actually accepting those changes until you export it. OK, and from there it will obviously if you brought that JPEG back in or whatever, that will start losing quality if you rasterized it. Um, Suffice to say, that as long as it's got this little icon, you can squash and stretch it to your heart's content. What I'm going to do just for the sake of demonstration is I'm going to rasterize this layer. And don't worry, we can come back to this later. Just to show you that if I shrink this down to be really small and apply the changes and then shrink this up to be really big, you can already see that it's going to start to get pixelized and lose a lot of quality. OK, I'm going to shrink it down again and shrink it up again. And you can see it's getting really bad now. Whereas if I do that with an image that has a smart object applied to it, I can squash and stretch it to my heart's content because it's not actually changing the quality of the image. It's just getting a frame and fitting that image to it. Now, obviously, if I blow this image up to larger than its original portions, it's still going to lose a little bit of quality when we export um, because that information isn't there for us to use. OK, but you can get away with a little bit more. That's the important thing. So let's drop this image in. Let's hold Alt and Shift to scale it up and let's position it in our frame so that we're happy. OK, so you may have seen me zooming all the way around this place. Um, now, don't get too worried about that. All I'm doing is using my mouse wheel and holding Alt to zoom in and out like that. It's just a quicker way to zoom and pan around. If you hold space bar, you get a little hand and you can, if you're zoomed in, click and move around your image, OK, which is quite simple. Those are the two real navigation tools that we'll be using this time around. Zoom, holding Alt and the scroll wheel and pan, holding space and clicking about the canvas. I mean, most of this stuff is used in everyday software nowadays, um, so I'm not going to go into that in too much detail. 
However, what I am going to do now is talk about how we can start adjusting this image a little bit. So one thing that Photoshop is very good at is um, editing the visuals of a photograph. OK, uh, that's what it got started off doing. Um, now, I'm going to show you two ways to do the same thing, and then I'm going to explain why perhaps one way in certain circumstances is better than the other. Say, for example, on this image, we wanted to flatten it out a little bit and bring up some of these dark areas because it looks a bit too high contrast for our liking. OK, there's two different ways you can do that using the same tool. You can either have your layer selected and go to image adjustments curves, and that brings up a dialog box where you can physically adjust um, the RGB values according to light. OK, now that does exactly the same thing as coming down to this circle option down here, which is the adjustment layer option, clicking and choosing curves. However, the difference being that when you create it from here, it creates an adjustment layer that is separate to your normal layer. Whereas when you create it from your image window, it will directly apply whatever effect, excuse me, directly apply whatever effect to your layer as a smart filter. Now, there may be different circumstances that each one of those works better. Um, in this one, for example, I don't want this to affect any other layers. And if I made it in an adjustment layer, it would do that by default. It would affect everything that's beneath the adjustment layer. So in this circumstance, I'm going to want to go to edit uh, image adjustments curves. However, you can do the same things from adjustment layers if you want them to affect multiple things. Say, for example, you had a stack of photos that you had manipulated and then you wanted to flatten those out a bit. However, suffice to say for the moment that with curves, you can adjust RGB values according to light. OK, meaning this top right corner is the bright areas of the image and this bottom left corner is the dark areas of the image. And if you create points along this curve graph here and start dragging them around, you can start to see that you can affect the image in really strong ways. This is affecting all the channels at the moment. You can actually only affect red, green or blue if you wanted to. So you can get rid of all the green and then get rid of all the blue, you know, things like that. This is how you can some create some really, really cool effects. What we're going to do this time, though, is quite subtle. We're going to go up to curves. We're going to create a point on this first cross here. And then we're going to just slowly and ever so slightly bring up the bottom of this um, line in our graph and what that does is it takes the pure black values and just lightens them up a little bit so you can see that if i apply this now and then hit Control z you can flick between your options of what your last edit just was okay and you can see in the history window actually that this is toggling on and off the last thing that we did if you want to go back more than one step you can't spam Control z you have to spam Control alt z like so okay and that'll go all the way through back your history and you can just click on the latest item to bring everything back. Now, I'm pretty much OK with that as the way it is. Um, however, for the sake of showing you guys a few options, I'm going to start playing around a little bit with this. Uh, for example, under images adjustments, we chose curves, but there are things like brightness and contrast. So you can brighten up and decrease or increase the contrast of an image. You can do uh, things with the levels, which affects, again, the black and white, apart from it basically reduces the cap of those blacks and whites rather than reducing them um, on an arc. So curves would affect black and the colors near it, whereas in this one we are physically adding or reducing the amount of black or white in the image as a pure color by itself. Um, you can do curves, which we've just done. Exposure is exactly the same or works to replicate rather the exact same um, physics of a camera. So the more you expose, the more it would look overexposed like it does in film. Um, some of these other ones are quite nice. Hue and saturation, you're probably going to be using a lot. So I'll just show you this one quickly. With hue and saturation, you can change basically the default um, balance of the image. So you can take all of the colors in your image and just shift the master hue around to really start to mess with the colors here say for example you didn't want to do anything too drastic but you thought the background could be a little bit more green overall you can bring some green light into that or bring some blue light into that if you hit colorize it'll turn everything to a shade of the color that you're choosing okay like so might be a bit much for this image i don't think it needs it but i'm just showing you what's there you can also do photo filters. So you can warm your image up a little bit, which I think we will do. Um, you can do cooling ones like cyan or a physical cooling filter. And these top six 
um, work to replicate real life ones. I'm going to leave it on warming for now and I'm just going to reduce the density to about 20%. Okay, so you can see that you can really start to manipulate images uh, in really powerful ways and you can turn off individual on and off individual effects by toggling them here. And the order of these effects does affect how the image will look. If you're applying a photo filter before you're bringing up the curves, for example, then obviously that's going to change the colors in the image. OK, so we're going to want the curves and then the photo filter. So we are done with this image now, pretty much. It's on the background. We're ready to go. What we're going to start doing next time is going to start manipulating it using the tools over here and building some shapes onto it and things like that as well. So apologies if this is a little bit slow for people, but I really wanted this to be like my other intro to series, people that have probably only opened up a Photoshop a couple of times in their life. Um, so if it is a bit too slow for you, don't worry. I've got plenty of other more advanced Photoshop tutorials. Um, if it is, if you are the target audience for this and you find me going a little bit too fast, whatever, let me know and I'll take it into account for future tutorials. However, in the meantime, find an image that you like, bung it into Photoshop and start playing around with some of these adjustments or some of these um, adjustment layers over here, which all do the same thing. Have a play, see what you think, and join me next time when we start manipulating and messing around with this image in terms of its geometry, which is very exciting. Thanks for watching, everybody, and I'll see you all next time on TipTap. Remember to subscribe for more tips, tricks, and tutorials. Thanks for watching.